हेलो नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट इन वाचिंग वेंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा हेलो अगेन आई हैव न्यूज फॉर यू एंड फॉर अ चेंज इट्स नॉट अबाउट वॉर और एन इम्पेंडिंग रिसेशन और अ वायरस it's more personal and it's good news first post has crossed 1 million subscribers on youtube in our world of more than 8 billion people this may seem like a very small number but for me and my team it means a lot more than we can put in words and i'm here to thank you for your support because this has been a very special journey both personally and professionally in a country with 400 news channels who needs another news platform we asked ourselves this question every day as we put together the show for you Why should you watch us? Why should you subscribe to us? We think of this every day. When we started in January, we had less than 200,000 subscribers. It was a very very small base, but you cheered us from the word go. We launched Vantage on the 26th of January this year, and you joined our journey. In a post-pandemic world, going viral can be a tricky affair, but trust me when I say this, we are not complaining about this virality. You watched and shared our stories. and they started coming back to us it's the biggest prize i say if you think i'm getting carried away please bear with me like i said this has been special it's been a learning curve because we knew knew our stories we understood our subjects but we were getting used to the medium you helped us with feedback and so many comments thank you for writing you told us what won't work and what we shouldn't be doing thank you for critiquing and you kept coming back every day to watch us thank you for watching and subscribing we hear you so keep the conversation going we truly believe that in this day and age time is more valuable than anything and you give us your time we are committed to making it worthwhile to highlighting india's perspective on global issues to tracking developments that shape our world to reading between the lines and to telling stories that really matter in the weeks and months ahead we will bring you more shows we are entering a very exciting phase we want to experiment we want to take you where the story is you know they're right when they say that storytelling is the most powerful way to put ideas in the world today and you help us hone that skill so thank you for making us 1 million strong i say we're only getting started In the headlines tonight, the Wagner Group says it will take no more Ukrainian prisoners; it will kill them instead. That's the claim made by the chief of the Russian mercenary group. This is after a video showed an alleged Russian prisoner of war being shot by Ukrainians. Political realignment in West Asia continues. Will Turkey and Syria bury the hatchet next? They've been at odds since the Syrian war began in 2011. They'll meet tomorrow in talks brokered by Moscow and attended by Tehran. India and China hold the 18th round of military level talks to de-escalate 3 years after the latest border standoff began. The last talks were held in December 2022. China's defense minister will be in India next month for the SCO summit. Credit Suisse says customers withdrew over 68 billion dollars in the first 3 months of 2023. This happened just before the Swiss banking giant's takeover by rival UBS. And Japan is set to approve its first abortion pill. The public were asked to submit their opinion through an online portal. Currently, only surgical abortion is available in Japan. Imagine this. You're at work, you've come up with the next big idea. It's the kind of idea that will guarantee you a promotion. So you write it down, complete with your notes and a PowerPoint presentation, and just before your presentation, someone spills water on your laptop. I'm sure some of you have been there. Guess who's joined your club now? Xi Jinping, the president of China. He had a grand plan to broker peace in Ukraine, to be called the peacemaker. But one of his wolf warriors has poured water on it. We're talking about the man on your screen, Lu Shai. He's China's ambassador in Paris and he's in the headlines for an interview. An interview where he talked about former Soviet states. 
More than 30 years back, when the USSR broke up, 15 new countries were formed. Today, the world recognizes them as independent nations. But the Chinese ambassador said they're not independent. And this statement has triggered a storm. China has a diplomatic crisis on its hands. At least four European states have protested. Baltic states are furious. Chinese diplomats are scrubbing traces of that interview. And China's so-called Ukraine peace plan is in tatters. Tonight, we'll discuss all of it, starting with the interview. Ambassador Liu of China spoke to a French news network, and the Chinese side shared a full transcript of the interview, both in Mandarin and French. But if you look for it now, you won't find it. Because the Chinese embassy in France has taken it down. We looked for it too. No trace. But from other sources, we've managed to access some quotes. The interviewer asked Ambassador Liu about the war in Ukraine, also about the status of Crimea. Crimea is a peninsula that Russia took from Ukraine in the year 2014. So the Chinese ambassador was asked a very straight, basic question. Is Crimea a part of Ukraine? And here's how he responded. I'm quoting. It depends on how you perceive the problem. There is a history. Crimea was originally Russian. It was Khrushchev who offered Crimea to Ukraine during the period of the Soviet Union. That's how it began. And Ambassador Liu just made it worse as he completed the answer. Let me quote again. Even these ex-Soviet Union countries do not have effective status, as we say, under international law, because there is no international accord to concretize their status as a sovereign country. Let that sink in. And do remember, this is not a slip of tongue. Ambassador Liu very clearly said, former Soviet states are not independent, and that their sovereignty has not been recognized under international law. This is a top Chinese diplomat questioning the sovereignty of 15 countries. No wonder China is facing a severe backlash from Europe. The strongest reactions have come from the Baltic states, Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia. All three were part of the Soviet Union and all three have summoned the top Chinese diplomat in their country. Latvia has called the comments, quote-unquote, completely unacceptable. Estonia said China's position, and I'm quoting again, is incomprehensible. And Lithuania went a step ahead. Its foreign minister said they don't trust China, especially when it comes to brokering peace in Ukraine. And backing them is the EU's top diplomat, Joseph Borrell. He called the Chinese statement, and I'm quoting, unacceptable. Even Ukraine has weighed in. Remember, President Zelensky wanted to speak to Xi Jinping. He wanted to discuss the Chinese peace plan. He even invited the Chinese president to visit Kiev. But all of that may change now. Here's what Ukraine's ambassador to France has said. Text question, who owns Crimea, is revealing as usual. Next time, it will be good to expand who owns Vladivostok. Such comments are still coming in. It is totally and totally unacceptable. We are denouncing uh, such a statement and I hope that the uh, bosses of this ambassador will make things straight. Uh, well, first of all, it's completely unacceptable. Uh, and uh, later today, uh, three Baltic states uh, will be summoning uh, representatives, in our case, the Charge d'Affaires and other capitals is the ambassador, to ask for clarification. Has Chinese uh, position changed? Uh, on, the, on the independence and to remind him that uh, we are not post-Soviet countries, we are the countries that were illegally occupied by Soviet Union. China needs to tell us that the position of the ambassador in Paris is not the official position of China. China is in damage control mode and their biggest worry is France. The French president, remember, went out on a limb to back Beijing. He went to China earlier this month. He tried to get China to broker peace in Ukraine. And for doing this, he got a lot of brickbats from Europe. But after a statement like this one, will Macron still be able to bat for China? Will he be in a position to bat for China? Paris has said it was dismayed by Ambassador Liu's comments. Listen to this. We learned with dismay of the remarks of the Chinese ambassador to France concerning the borders of the countries which became independent with the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. It is up to China to say whether these remarks reflect its position, which we hope not. China took the cue. It tried to distance itself from the comments of its ambassador. 
After the dissolution of the Soviet Union, China was one of the first countries to establish diplomatic ties with relevant countries. Since the establishment of diplomatic ties, China has always adhered to the principles of mutual respect and equal treatment to develop bilateral, friendly and cooperative relations. The Chinese side respects the status of the member states as sovereign states after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. But it's a very poor face saver, because look at the man whose words China is trying to disown. He's a repeat offender, yet a top diplomat. Ambassador Liu belongs to a special category of Chinese diplomats called wolf warriors. They specialize in an aggressive and combative style of diplomacy. And Liu has a long history of doing this. Last year, he gave another controversial interview. It was when U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan. Ambassador Liu called for the re-education of Taiwan. And in China, re-education is code for persecution. It's what the state does in Xinjiang. They've locked up more than a million Uyghurs in the name of re-education. And these people are now being forced to pledge loyalty to the Communist Party. Ambassador Liu suggested the same for Taiwan. Then at the height of the pandemic, Liu's embassy published a blog. It was about the Western response to the pandemic. The blog said the West handled the virus recklessly. It talked about France too, the country where he's stationed. And it said that health workers left the elderly in nursing homes to die. What a claim to make. So Ambassador Liu tends to wade into controversy. But this is not the problem of an individual. It's about the system that he represents. That's what's problematic. China practices what he's saying. It tries to push a flawed interpretation of history, a version that suits Beijing, that benefits the Communist Party. China tries to impose its worldview. And its ambassador is only taking that forward. In 2021, Xi Jinping delivered a speech. He said, no history, love the party. That's exactly what his foot soldiers are doing now. Meanwhile, more than a year into the war, and despite all the sanctions and bad press, the Russians seem to be doing quite okay. The West's economic weapon has neither isolated nor demolished the Russian economy. In fact, according to the assessment of Western agencies, Russia is growing faster than the UK and Russia's ultra-rich are getting richer. Look at the kind of money they're making. In 2022, Russian billionaires were worth $353 billion. $353 billion. In 2023, that is this year, their wealth went up to $505 billion. That's an increase of $152 billion. And this is despite the sanctions and the war. The wealth of an average Russian billionaire has gone up by around $600 million. And the number has gone up too. Look at the latest Forbes list. In 2022, there were 88 Russian billionaires on the list. This year, there, there are 110. So during the war, 22 Russian billionaires have been added to the Forbes list. If these numbers appear mind-boggling, wait till you hear the next ones. The Forbes list includes sanctioned Russian billionaires as well. Do you know how many there are? 46. 46 out of 110 are sanctioned individuals. They're blacklisted by the US, the UK and the European Union, but their wealth is growing. How did this happen? What's driving the wealth of Russians? We made a list of factors that are at play. And first among them are the sanctions themselves. They're supposed to punish individuals or entities, but the impact of sanctions is overestimated. The second factor at play is the rise in commodity prices. Russia's richest make most of their money from selling commodities. I'm talking about things like oil, metals and natural resources. They became expensive after the war. The war and the sanctions led to shortages, so the prices went up. And the Russian oligarchs milked this crisis. Their businesses remained immune to the sanctions and they kept making money. In fact, the rich list has more clues. The new Russian billionaires came from a wide variety of businesses. They've made their money in snacks, supermarkets, chemicals and pharmaceuticals. And these are businesses driven by domestic demand. And this is another sign the Russian economy is still working because domestic demand remains high. Russians are still spending money. Remember, this is not the first time they're facing economic sanctions. A lot of them have seen this before. In 1974, for instance, the U.S. wanted to punish Soviet Russia. 
President Gerald Ford was in the White House then and he wanted to punish Moscow over human rights, so he imposed trade restrictions. They were called the jackson vanik Amendment. Then, in the late 1970s, the Jimmy Carter administration sanctioned the Soviet Union. This was over the war in Afghanistan. These sanctions ranged from a grain embargo to export controls and technology, also restrictions on bilateral cooperation and a boycott at the Olympics. To some extent, the isolation campaign worked. But this time, it's not working. Since the war began in Ukraine, the West has slapped over 11,000 sanctions. More than 11,000 in a year. They've frozen some $300 billion of Russia's foreign reserves. But how much has it helped? Russian billionaires are still making money and the Russian economy is still growing. Like I said, it's doing better than the UK. That's what the IMF said earlier this year. That Russia is doing better than the UK. So have the sanctions failed completely? Well, yes. If we look at their political goal, Russia is neither isolated nor persuaded to end the war. You see, the goal of sanctions is to change the behavior of nation states. That's one measure of their success. And on that count, the sanctions against Russia have failed. And now let's turn our focus to the Sudan. The fighting between rival military groups is still raging on. More than 420 people have been killed. More than 3,700 have been injured. This is according to the World Health Organization. A ceasefire was declared during Eid, a 72-hour ceasefire, but it wasn't a great success. Violent clashes kept erupting throughout the weekend. There were breathers in between, and that's the window that the world was looking for. Many countries carried out special operations. They evacuated their citizens from the Sudan. The US, the UK, France and Germany pulled out some of their diplomatic staff. They flew military helicopters and transport aircraft into an airfield near Sudan's capital, Khartoum. It has been a complex operation and it has been a successful operation. First, the staff of the European Union, 21 people are already in Europe. And Many more European Union citizens and others are already out of Sudan. I cannot give you the concrete figure, more than 1,000 people for sure. Uh, I want to thank France especially for taking our people out. And I want to thank the combined efforts of many countries that took their national, but also all nationals that they could pick. These other nationals that France picked up include Indians. We don't know how many, but we can tell you that some of them were Indians. France evacuated people from 28 other countries. A total of 388 people were flown out of the Sudan on Sunday night. The US and European nations were in talks with the Sudanese army and that's how they managed to rescue the diplomatic staff. They got Sudan's de facto leader, Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, to allow aircraft into a Sudanese airbase. Some countries rescued their citizens by sea. Yesterday, a convoy had set out from Khartoum to Port Sudan at the Red Sea. Evacuation was long. We moved from an area in Khartoum to another area that is far from Khartoum, around 1,200 to 1,300 kilometers. We moved by land. It was a bit difficult, but thank God we were together under the support of the Jordanian embassy. Thank God it was successfully done. Jordan picked up some of its citizens. Saudi Arabia evacuated 91 Saudi nationals and about 66 people from other countries from this port. At least three Indian nationals were rescued by Saudi Arabia. Then there are those fleeing by land. These include citizens of neighboring countries like Egypt. In fact, Cairo has about 10,000 citizens in the Sudan. It says it has evacuated more than 400 of them. And of course, there are Sudanese people who want to escape the fighting as well. Almost 20,000 have fled to neighboring Chad. It's mostly people from areas in western Sudan, like the Darfur region. But hundreds of people, locals and foreigners, are still trapped in the Sudan. Most countries have asked their citizens to stay indoors, away from the fighting, and this includes India. There are about 3,000 Indian nationals in Sudan at the moment. Both diplomatic staff and people who settled there over the past few decades. New Delhi is poised to conduct a rescue operation. It has positioned two C-130J military transport aircraft in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. It has also sent a naval ship to Port Sudan. But like most other countries, India is waiting for the right time. Why aren't all nations rushing to the rescue? 
because it's extremely complex. First, the Sudan's airspace is closed as the battle rages on. The Sudanese army is conducting airstrikes on rebel positions. Khartoum is the focal point for much of the violence, and it's also unfortunately where most foreigners are trapped. It took almost a week for the US and European nations to get the nod to fly out their citizens. And even then, it was a dangerous mission. A French convoy heading to an evacuation plane was reportedly attacked by the Rapid Support Forces, the paramilitary group that is fighting the Sudanese army. That's Rapid Support Forces, RSF. One French national was wounded. The route to Port Sudan is rife with danger too. A Qatari national was injured yesterday when a convoy to Port Sudan was attacked. Now, Sudan's army has blamed the RSF for this too. Neither France nor Qatar commented immediately after these incidents. Clearly, no one wants to aggravate the situation or the tensions. For every country, the top priority at the moment is to bring their people back home safe and sound. In Pakistan, another audio leak is making waves. It features two women, Mehjabeen Noon and Rafia Tariq. One is the mother-in-law of the Chief Justice of Pakistan. The other is the wife of a lawyer for the Pakistan tehreek e insaf party. That's Imran Khan's party. So the Chief Justice's mother-in-law is set to be talking to the wife of an opposition lawyer. Whichever way you look at it, it's a murky affair. And questions are being asked on all sides. It's making national headlines. The government supporters ask, why was this conversation taking place at all? The opposition asks, why was this conversation being recorded and why has it been leaked? Now, let me give you some context. The Chief Justice of Pakistan is hearing some important cases and they involve the government. The judge recently gave an order to the Election Commission of Pakistan. He said elections in the Punjab province must be held on the 14th of May. This order was widely seen as a blow to the government because the government wanted the provincial elections to be delayed. Now, if it turns out that a very close relative of the Chief Justice is talking to someone from the opposition camp, it sparks accusations of bias, especially when you go through the contents of the conversation. Listen to this. मैंने कहा तुमने लाहौर के जलसे में मौजूद थी वहाँ लाखों बंदा था इसी तरह हर शहर में लाखों बंदा है और तुम सिर्फ ये अंदाजा लगा लो कि तुम्हारे लिए कितनी दुनिया दवा कर रही है इस वक्त इससे तुम्हारी हिम्मत बहुत और तुम्हारी सेफ्टी और तुम्हारी हिम्मत करे और उसके नहीं नहीं उसकी सेफ्टी उनको कमजोर करे गेंदे हिम्मत उनको तो अल्लाह करे और जो बाकियों को अंदा कर दे मैं तो ये कह रही हूँ मैं वो तो जब वो तो प्रेशर से हम जिस कंट्री लुक एट द वे दे आर डूइंग इट वही ना बदलाव जैसे ही है वाइज ही गॉट दी अथॉरिटी डू डू इट इट डस साउंड क्वाइट कॉन्स्पिरेटोरियल बट देयर्स अ कैच we don't know if this audio clip is genuine, which brings us to the opposition's questions. Who recorded and leaked this audio clip? And who stands to gain from the leak? The Pakistani government is having a field day. Its ministers are spreading the clip on social media. Interior Minister Rana Sanaullah has demanded a forensic audit. He said if the clip is fabricated, those involved will be punished. But here's what he said next. And let me quote from his statement. But if the clip is real, then accountability should be sought from those behind these conversations and the person about whom the conversation is should resign. Those who were mentioned in the audio, they should show grace and step down. And that's where it gets tricky. A judge is ruling against the government of Pakistan. Suddenly an audio clip surfaces that shows the judge in poor light and ministers are already asking for his resignation without proof that the clip is, is real. It's led to the usual round of finger pointing and of course, the usual furor. Opposition leader and PTI member Fawad Chaudhry has raised this. He said, no move is being made to address the constant audio leaks in Pakistan and now in ho even housewives are becoming victims to the leaks. He also said that illegally tapping calls is a punishable offence. All very sanctimonious, never mind the fact that the PTI was happy to jump on leaks when it suited them. You see, Pakistani audio leaks started last September. The private conversations of various high-profile leaders have been leaked. And this list includes 
Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif, former Prime Minister Imran Khan and the ruling coalition's Maryam Nawaz. So the leaks are spread across Pakistan's political spectrum. They take place at the highest of levels and whenever they come out, the other side is always quick to take advantage. From sleazy phone call allegations against Imran Khan to talks about buying lawmakers or Maryam Nawaz making deaths look like accidents. Pakistan's audio leaks apparently have it all. No wonder the law does not seem to deter the leakers. And it also makes you question the security apparatus. Honestly, what are they doing? How are high-profile politicians falling victim to unlawful phone tapping? Is it incompetence or connivance from the security forces? Well, whatever the case, the rot in Pakistani politics continues to get more foul. And now, as Fawad Chaudhary said, even housewives aren't safe. And speaking of rot, the U.S. law enforcement comes to mind. It should be protecting its citizens, but often it does the very opposite. We're talking about racist killings by the U.S. police, deadly police brutality, and it disproportionately affects people of color. You may remember George Floyd. He was a black man, unjustly killed by a white police officer in 2020. There were massive protests, a movement called Black Lives Matter. But racism remains rampant in the United States of America, and now the United Nations has intervened. A team of UN human rights experts is touring the US to ensure accountability and justice. Here's a report. Law enforcement in the US has structural problems. This is not a secret. The US police kills an average of three people a day and last year was their deadliest. They killed at least 1,176 people. This was a record high. So now, they're under the scanner. And this was long awaited. The United Nations is holding America accountable. A team of human rights experts have arrived in the country. They're part of an independent panel, and they're on a two-week visit. They're set to tour Washington, D.C., Atlanta, Los Angeles, Chicago, Minneapolis, and New York City. This panel was established in 2021, in the aftermath of George Floyd's death in 2020. He was a black man killed by a white police officer, and there was massive outcry, not just in the country, but across the world. And this forced a strong response. And I remember one mother in particular said to me, said to us actually, uh, said, you always talk about George Floyd. Every day we have a George Floyd here and nobody talks about it. Nobody talks about these cases. So it, it really marked us quite a bit. So what we started looking more and more of where are the George Floyds of this world? And we, as, as we were saying, we, we realized that we are only touching the tip of the iceberg on, the, uh, on, that, uh, on that front. But not much has changed since then. So now the panel plans to monitor racial injustice in the country and take note of its policing, examine its laws and practices. They want to ensure accountability and justice because Floyd's murder is only one of many such instances. Racial disparities persist in the US and they've become a norm for its law enforcement. We found worrying trends of associating blackness with criminality and other biases that shape the interaction of people of African descent with law enforcement and the criminal justice system. Out of the 1,176 people killed by police last year, 24% were black, even though they make only 13% of the population. They were three times more likely to be killed by US police as compared to white people. And this inequality varies. It's more severe in some cities like Minneapolis, which is also under the radar. Black residents here were killed at a rate 28 times higher than white residents. And in Chicago, the rate is 25 times higher. Studies even show that the use of force is higher on black people. There's more use of electroshock weapons like tasers, dog bites, batons and beatings. These tools are often misapplied in situations and used as a routine protocol. We understand that there's needs to deal with crime. But you don't fight crime by becoming criminals yourself. 
And while this happens, U.S. President Joe Biden continues to demand for funding the police. There's a national pattern of racial injustice in the country, and it's seeping into its police infrastructure. If the public doesn't feel safe with law enforcement, what's the point? And criminal assault under the guise of policing is another matter altogether. But this is not the first time a panel will analyze policing in the U.S. It will also not be the first to recommend changes. But hopefully, it will add to growing protests for change. And every drop counts. Maybe someday, the U.S. will listen. In Australia, a major shake-up is underway, the biggest military reform of the decade. Canberra has released a new defence policy today. The paper says the world has changed and Australia's defence forces are not fully prepared to tackle the challenges of today. We confront the most challenging strategic circumstances since the Second World War, both in our region and indeed around the world. That's why we're investing in our capabilities and we're investing in our relationships to build a more secure Australia and a more stable and prosperous region. Who is Prime Minister Albanese referring to? He's talking about China. The report does not mention China, but the implication is clear. Australia is worried about the South China Sea and Beijing sweeping claims on it. This is a disputed region. China claims all of it. Now, Australia believes Beijing's claims, and I'm quoting, threaten the global rules-based order in the Indo-Pacific in a way that adversely impacts Australia's national interests. So they see China as a threat. And what do they plan to do about it? Firm up their defences. Reassess their priorities. Effectively, this review is about military spending, about where and how Australia spends its defence budget which is reworking its priorities and redirecting these funds. The first big change is this one. Australia wants more long-range missiles. Earlier, it relied on more land-based weapons, but today's report points to a hard shift. Australia will buy more missiles. And what kind of missiles will these be? Those with the ability to target beyond 500 kilometres and to do so with great precision. Australia now views its military threats differently. The new defence policy says Australia can no longer be protected by its geographic isolation. We now live in the missile age, so the Australian forces need to prepare for that. Reports say some weapons programs will be done away with. One of them is an infantry fighting vehicle project. It will be scaled back. Instead, they'll focus on weapons with long-range capabilities. These are weapons that can strike ships at sea, like HIMARS and army landing crafts. So these are the tactical changes. What about the political changes? The new defence policy also talks about alliances. Australia wants to work more closely with its partners, countries like India. In fact, the report does talk about India. Here's what it says, and I'm quoting, Australia also needs to continue to expand its relationships and practical cooperation with key powers, including Japan and India, and invest in regional architecture. For military planning, in terms of our strategic geography, the primary area of military interest for Australia's national defence is the immediate region encompassing the northeastern Indian Ocean through maritime Southeast Asia into the Pacific. This is the area Australia is interested in. It has some key shipping and trade routes, and Australia needs them open to ensure its economic security. So there are clear conclusions in this report and important takeaways. For Australia, working with allies like India is now a priority, and China is a clear threat of course, Beijing is not thrilled about this assessment. I want to emphasize that China has always pursued a defensive national defense policy. We are committed to maintaining peace and stability in the Asia-Pacific and the world. We do not pose a threat to any country. We hope that some countries would stop using China as an excuse to boost their military and don't hype up baseless Chinese threat theories. Well, that's China being China. Australia has not responded to this yet. It plans to spend a total of $19 billion over a period of four years. The US and Russia are dangerously close to an armed conflict. This year, 2023, New Delhi will be the capital of global diplomacy. 
For a country as diverse as ours, with 88% of the population illiterate, it was a very big deal to write a constitution, and that too, the world's largest. Meanwhile, if we may, here's a Republic Day gift from India for the BBC. A list of suggestions for the BBC for their upcoming documentaries. Number one, the Kohinoor and the colonial loot. Number two, an outdated monarchy and unhealthy obsession with the royals. Number three, racism in 2023. We're waiting. And Australia isn't the only country reassessing its defense priorities. South Korea is doing the same. It has two difficult neighbors, North Korea and China, and Seoul is debating an old but urgent question. Should it have nuclear weapons? So far, they've relied on America's support, their so-called nuclear security umbrella. But can it be trusted anymore? South Korea is not very sure about Washington's commitment. Its president, Yoon suk Yeol, is on a visit to the U.S., his first as president. And his agenda is quite clear. He wants solid assurances from the White House. Given North Korea's nuclear threats and missile testing spree, can the South count on America's nuclear arsenal or should it acquire its own? Our next report has more. Tensions are rising in the Korean Peninsula. North Korea is firing missiles like there's no tomorrow. Pyongyang calls them tests, meant to deter its supposed enemies. Countries in the region are anxious. Japan recently had to issue emergency evacuation orders for its citizens in Hokkaido. The reason behind the scare? A North Korean long-range missile. So the situation in the region is volatile, which is why South Korean President Yoon Suk Kyol is on a state visit to the United States. He boarded a flight for Washington today and will be in the U.S. for the next five days. President Joe Biden is going to host him for a high-stakes summit. It's a summit that could decide the fate of relations between both these nations. And South Korea has some big asks. It is questioning America's commitment to its security. It is unsure whether Washington would intervene in case a conflict with North Korea or China breaks out. Seoul needs to be prepared for a nuclear attack from North Korea. Technically, some vague American promises are already in place. Washington even has a term for them. It's called extended deterrence. Basically, South Korea is eligible to be protected under the American nuclear umbrella. But that's not enough for Seoul. It wants a bigger say in operating the USA's extended deterrence assets. Seoul says both sides are working to make the deterrence more concrete. Reports say President Biden would pledge quote-unquote substantial steps to deter a North Korean nuclear attack. They're said to be working on a joint document too. It outlines the conditions for the US to retaliate with nuclear weapons if South Korea is attacked. If this document sees the light of day, it will be the first time that the U.S. promises nuclear retaliation in a written document. And South Korea will be the first non-NATO ally to get such a written assurance. The joint document could even include a significant provision, one which allows for the deployment of American nuclear assets on the Korean Peninsula at the request of South Korea. The nuclear debate was reignited in January when President Yoon made a startling suggestion. He argued that it was time for South Korea to develop nuclear weapons. Pretty soon he backtracked, but by then, as they say, the cat was out of the bag. Public sentiment was in favor of having nukes. Polls say more than 70% of South Koreans want their country to develop nuclear weapons. Another poll found that 54% of the respondents do not trust America's assurances. They said the U.S. would not risk its own safety to protect South Korea. So the U.S. must assure that it's not making empty promises and that it's willing to stand by and defend its allies. It has a lot of damage control to do. Highly classified American documents have made their way to the public domain. They show how Washington has been spying on allies, including South Korea. Seoul has not publicly condemned the Americans for this, but the issue may come up in private conversations. Our last story is from Kenya, where more than 50 people are dead, not because of disease, not because they met with an accident, not even because of a natural calamity or war. 
These people died due to starvation. Again, not because food was not available, but because they chose to starve themselves. Not out of free will. These were followers of a cult and their preacher told them to starve to death to meet Jesus. It's disturbing. And here's the really scary part. An 800 acre area woodland has been declared a crime scene. And authorities say the number of people dead could be much higher than what they've revealed right now. Here's a report. Do you want to meet Jesus? A Kenyan cult knows the way. All you need to do is starve to death. Authorities in Kenya's coastal town of Malindi have a lot on their hands. Their priority right now is digging up dead bodies. It's all part of a larger investigation into a religious cult, one which has already claimed 51 lives. It all started last week in the Kilifi County. Police rescued 15 cult members of the Good News International Church. They were all starving and admitted that they were told to starve to death. Four of the people who were rescued died while on their way to the hospital. Information received is that uh, the people there were being starved after being radicalized by a certain uh, member of a church who told them that uh, their, their work in this world is done and that they are waiting for, they should die and go and see their, their creator. So far, the, the information uh, at hand is that there are more people who are believed to be in the bush. In the days that have followed, the death toll has gone up to 51, all members of the same cult, a cult led by this man. He's Paul Mackenzie Thinge, leader of the Good News International Church. He convinced several of his followers that the only way to meet Jesus Christ was to starve to death. Mackenzie has been arrested and has refused to eat or drink while in police custody. There is no free will at play here, also no religiosity. What's happening in Kenya is the textbook definition of blind faith laced with radicalism, which is perhaps why Kenya's president has likened cult leaders to terrorists. Terrorists use religion to advance their heinous acts. People like Mr. Mackenzie are using religion to do exactly the same thing. Another reason why the cult's actions are supremely criminal is this. Children are being starved and suffocated by their parents, all because the church leader told the parents to do so. We have visited some homes in some villages, such as Bethlehem and Judea. And in the villages, you find some parents have lost all their children, or they themselves die. Personally, I have visited about 18 grave sites of children. Meanwhile, authorities are convinced they will find more dead bodies and people on the brink of extreme starvation. The Kenya Red Cross Society has made a disturbing revelation. It says 112 people are missing in Malindi. Cults are not a new phenomenon, certainly not in Kenya. It's a very religious country, predominantly a Christian one. There have been sporadic instances of cult-related deaths in the past too. In most cases, the perpetrators were either not found or they were not prosecuted. That certainly helped create an air of invincibility around cult leaders. Cult radicalism also plagues several other African nations. In 2000, a church in southwestern Uganda was locked. The doors and windows were nailed shut from the outside. And it was then set on fire with hundreds of people inside. All those who died were members of a cult called the Movement for the Restoration of the Ten Commandments of God. The cult believed the world would come to an end at the turn of the millennium. And while we're all still here, the world certainly went up in flames for the people who were in that church. Experts believe 10,000 cults still exist in the United States alone. These cults target vulnerable people. In Kenya, the desire to meet God has landed several people in graves. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. We're starting with the U.S. where two houses slid off a cliff in the state of Utah. These houses were already deemed unsafe and were empty. But we'll show you the dramatic footage. In California, a performance at Disneyland went horribly wrong after a prop dragon caught fire. And a snowboarding competition took place in Switzerland. 
Finally, taking you back in history, what makes April the 24th significant? On this day, the Rana Plaza tragedy took place in Bangladesh's capital, Dhaka. The year was 2013. An eight-story building with factories and shopping centers collapsed. The structure was built on swampy ground using shoddy material. The necessary clearances were not obtained. More than 1,000 people died in this tragedy. Over 2,000 were injured. Do you know what kind of factories were located in the building? Fast fashion brands. They failed to look after their em employees who worked in poor conditions. In 2016, a court ordered the building's owner to face trial for murder. Today, he's out on bail. This was the world's deadliest industrial accident since the Bhopal gas tragedy. We're leaving you with this. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Oh my gosh. Wow. Oh my. Wow. There it goes. from inside the BBC, they talk about the risk of violating Indian laws. It's easier to rake up the freedom of speech debate, but does it give anyone a free pass to knowingly violate the law? America supports India because it needs India's support in return. And India is working with the US because it suits India's interests. This is how geopolitics works. Last night, he diffused a crisis with his defense minister. But today, Netanyahu was confronted with a new problem. His cabinet seems to have rebelled against him. The UK is looking at the Indian subcontinent to fill its coffers. That India seems to be negotiating from a position of power, like a partner and not a former colony. US and Russia are dangerously close to an armed conflict. This year, 2023, New Delhi will be the capital of global diplomacy. For a country as diverse as ours, with 88% of the population illiterate, it was a very big deal to write a constitution, and that too, the world's largest. Meanwhile, if we may, 
Here's a Republic Day gift from India for the BBC. A list of suggestions for the BBC for their upcoming documentaries. Number one, the Kohinoor and the Colonial Loot. Number two, an outdated monarchy and unhealthy obsession with the royals. Number three, racism in 2023. We're waiting.